Welcome to the Cross Border Interviews. This is the show where we sit down with local elected leaders from all corners of Canada. Today, we are continuing our Friday journey of focusing on one municipality every Friday for the foreseeable future. And today, we find ourselves back in the beautiful city of Portage La Prairie, Manitoba. And joining us for this amazing focus on Portage La Prairie is none other than Councillor Colin Doyle. The city of Portage La Prairie has small town charm with a rich tapestry of history and natural beauty. Located along the Assiniboine River, the city is a harmonious blend of urban convenience and rural tranquility. Known as the friendly city, Portage La Prairie embraces a warm community spirit that welcomes both visitors and residents alike. This is Cross Border Interviews with Councillor Colin Doyle. Councillor, thank you so much for doing this. Greatly appreciate it. I want to start by getting to know who you are and the persona behind the councillor's chair somewhat. And I start my line of questioning off the same way, so you're no exception to this. Where did your sense of duty to serve your community come from, Colin? Well, I uh, I was born and raised in Portage, and uh, I, I moved away right after graduation, like a lot of 18 year olds who live in Portage most of their life, they share the opinion that there's nothing here for me and I need to flee this hometown of mine. And so I, I quickly realized, well, maybe not so quickly, but I, I lived in a couple of various locations. I moved to Winnipeg in Manitoba here. And then I went and worked at a ski resort in the Rocky mountains in BC and uh, ended up getting married, having children, and realized maybe Portage wasn't so bad. So I uh, came back to Portage, and uh, I have uh, started my life here with my family. And when I came back, I I came back under an unusual circumstance and uh, came back because my wife at the time uh, was quite sick. And so... I saw how in a very short amount of time after coming coming back to Portage, how the city rallied around my family. And so uh, when it came time to put my nomination in for the election, I thought, well, this is a right, this is a good time for me to pay back my city, which rallied around me and my family when we needed it the most. Okay, there's a lot to unpack there, and we're only yes. about three minutes into this conversation <laughs> already. Um, I, I want to start by uh, asking sort of a weird question to uh, sort of talk we talk about municipal politics, but you, you leave Portage, you go to Winnipeg, yeah. you go to BC, and then you come back. Prior to coming back to Portage with everything going on health-wise with your wife, had you considered municipal politics as something that was going to be something that you'd be getting into? Or was it until you came back and you saw the sort of community rally behind you, you sort of ultimately said, I'm going to rally behind the community and give back that way? Uh, yeah, it, it was never on my radar uh, whatsoever. And it, it was a, a little bit of twofold. Um, part of it was was giving back to my community who uh, helped us out so much. And the other part was, upon coming back home, I realized, you know, not a lot has changed in the 15 years that I was gone. And uh, there were some good things, there were some bad things that had changed. But all in all, there were a lot of growing communities in Manitoba, and Portage didn't seem to be one of them on the surface. And so that's another reason why I wanted to throw my name into the mix and uh, and try to be a part of the city on a grander scale. So, what was it about the draw to municipal politics? Because giving back, you can have given, you could have given back many different ways through nonprofits, through volunteerism. But in and correct me if I'm wrong here, because Manitoba is not the best for public publicly keeping their documents up to date on when people <laughs> decide to run for office. But from what I gather, you. This is your first term, so first elected in 2022, if I'm not mistaken. And from what I gather, this is the first time you put your name on the ballot. So 
What was it about the municipal draw that you said, okay, the best way, I could give back many different ways, but the best best way Colin believes that he can give back to his community is being around that table and making those decisions. Yeah, so um, I, I did go the route originally with uh, joining nonprofits and volunteering my time uh, with actually uh, – an organization like Central Plains Cancer Services, which uh, Mayor Knox is the executive executive director of. So uh, I, I went that route. And in 2018, I had considered putting my name in. But uh, at the time, there was just a lot going on in my life with, uh, you know, the the eventual loss of my wife at that time. And, and uh, I, I wanted to put my best foot forward and not jump in because the time was there. So I put it on the back burner. I waited, I researched, I read a lot uh, about municipal politics. And the thing that drew me to the municipal end of politics was it's the closest level to the actual citizens itself. Um, first off, I pol- uh, I'm sorry for the loss of your wife. Um, as someone who... I have been quite vocal about this. We're recording this on February 5th for those who are watching this at a later date. Um, one day after World uh, Cancer Day uh, across the world, which as uh, someone who's, who suffered from a brain tumor, a cancerous tumor over the last few years, I, I know the devastating effect that cancer can have on someone. And I all the sympathies towards you, man. Um, I, I, I wa- appreciate that. You as well. Uh, I want to talk about municipal politics, though, because that 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 brings a somewhat <laughs> of a smile to me. Um, yeah. So you have now been in the office of a municipal councillor for roughly about 16 months, give or take. Yeah. Um, was it what you expected for someone who is a sort of self-described green person coming into municipal politics? Was it what you expected looking back on the first few months, few almost year and a half into your term? So the um, right off the hop, I realized uh, it was not what I had expected at all, uh, in in a good way actually. Um, I was ready at the time I put my name in to uh, put a lot of work and a lot of effort into into what we do as a council. And once I got on the inside, I realized, you know you do get a lot of phone calls, you do get a lot of emails, but you don't have to jump and fix those problems. We in the city of Portage have an excellent administration and excellent staff. And uh, for the most part, I'm able to just take those emails, those phone calls and transfer them over to someone from our administration. And uh, they're the ones that actually handle it. Um, can, can I ask a weird question on that? When, yes. when was when was the moment you realized that? Because I I I am firmly in the belief that there's a lot of municipal councillors who get elected who feel the exact same way that you just described. You need to respond to everything. You need to help out on everything. But that's why you have right. administration. You're the policy. You're the governance. They're the people who put the uh, work to, uh, to the sort of the pavement in some sense. When was that moment for you? Was it the first month? Was it the first year? Was it yesterday <laughs> it was the uh i would say it was probably the first meeting <laughs> <laughs> when uh you know the, the first meeting you're a little bit uh deer in the headlights and you you know you come across a topic uh right off the hop and it's just okay well what time do you need me to be there you know oh, you don't have to join us you know we'll, we'll take care of it we'll get back to you you know with the outcome oh okay well that's <laughs> that's different, you know, different from what I thought. And so it was, uh, like I said, it was a welcome surprise. Uh, the, the council in Portage is, you know, it's a part-time commitment. Um, (laughs) you and I both know that's not the case though. Let's be honest. (laughs) And and further to that, I, I realized pretty quickly the, the time commitment is quite big, but, uh, it's not a uh, work boots and shovel in hand type of time commitment. You know, there's a lot of meetings to attend, uh, a lot of subcommittee, subcommittee meetings and ad hoc meetings. And uh, 
you know, the, those take up your time. And for me at the time when I was elected, I was also working full time. And so it's trying, it was trying to find a balance between my full time job. I also have a, a side gig as a first aid instructor. And now I'm a city councilor on top of that. So it's, it's fine. It was trying to find that balance without hitting burnout right away. So since then I've changed career paths and I am currently in the process of getting my real estate license. I'm just waiting for the stamped copy any day. And uh, so I've, I've had the opportunity to be at home quite a bit and be able to attend almost everything that uh, the city is involved in, which, which has been very nice for me. Now, I, I'm assuming during that time, and I should never assume on this show, but I'm going to assume a little bit here. I'm assuming during your tenure as a municipal councillor so far, you've had some pretty tough choices, decisions to make around that council table. Um, we are seeing the world come out of the global pandemic, COVID-19. We are seeing the economic challenges that not only municipalities face, but residents face as well. Um, you like you said, are the closest to the people. You, you, Your decisions you make impact them the day after. You don't go to Winnipeg to do your job. You don't go to Ottawa to do your job. You're in your community 24-7. How do you ensure that the decisions you make impact the people that you serve the most effectively, but not do it in a way that's going to neg negatively affect them? Right. So I guess, um, you know, with, with every decision that's made and some are, some are smaller and some are much larger. And I, I just think with the decisions that we make, we have to keep in mind that what is best for the people of our city, because right now we are foreseeing, or we, we are seeing a, uh, a major issues with affordability and, uh, there's a lot of people struggling right now. And so as, as a council, especially when it comes to budget time, we don't want to make that issue any larger for people, right? And so these decisions you make uh, that impact in real time, people's money, uh, you know, you, you really have to be conscious of these decisions because we as a council want to do everything possible at, but at the same time, we can't put the taxpayers at, um, you know, be, be putting our hands in their pockets to make all of our dreams come true. We have to be very conscious of that and very smart uh, with the with the funding to make sure that affordability is top of mind when it comes to budget time. So how do you do that? Because I can imagine if I go talk to 100 people in Portage, they're all going to say, well, council should have voted this way or council should have put money in this basket instead of this basket. How do you make those tough choices? Because you, at the end of the day, have that one vote. You, at the end of the day, have that deciding factor of who gets what every year. What are the, is there any parameters that you put on to issues that are put in front of Portage the Prairie Council that you say, okay, it needs to pass these tests for me to support them? Or is it you go out to the community, you ask for people's opinions, and they will determine the way that you vote on certain issues? Well, in the in the first budget, uh, the first budget that we had after I was elected, it was, uh, it was very different than doing the budget deliberations this year, because... <laughs> The, the, that budget was passed. The budget was uh, made by the previous council. <laughs> and uh, to be honest, uh, it was it was the back to that deer in the headlights thing. You know, a lot of nodding and looking around the room. You know, if I'm being honest, just seeing what everyone else's head is doing. And and uh, we're we're a council of six plus a mayor, and four out of our six are brand new never been in municipal politics before too so um as we're looking around the room at budget deliberations well you happen to catch everyone else's eyes because they're looking at you as well right uh whereas this year it was very different because now we have a year under our belt and when it comes to where the money is going to be placed uh again our administration is very very good and very very 
fiscally responsible. And uh, when the recommendations come up for certain things, uh, not everyone is in agreement with them. And we, we have a good, we have a good mix of uh, old and young and from different walks of life on our council. And it's uh, for, for me, the decisions that I make, I, I base on first and foremost, my gut feeling. Uh, secondly, I, now that I have a year under my belt from the last budget, I'm able to look around and say, you know, when organization X comes up at budget time, well, I know for a fact that they did this, this, and this last year, uh, partially funded by us as a city. And I have no problem putting the money back with said organization. And uh, when it comes to stuff like operations, we've had a major overhaul of our main street in Portage this Saskatchewan year. Saskatchewan Avenue, uh, God bless Saskatchewan it. Saskatchewan <laughs> Avenue, yeah. <laughs> and should be completed by uh, the fall of this year. So, um, you know, that was something. Now we have active transportation lanes that didn't exist in our city before. And so we need proper equipment to clear the snow for these active transportation lanes. And it's not equipment that we owned before because we never had them. So uh, you don't want to build the infrastructure and then not be able to maintain it year round. So, you know, decisions were made that we needed equipment and personnel to, to run the equipment, uh, you know, to make sure that these active transportation lanes we have are actually functional. <laughs> you, you mentioned something off the top of the show, uh, the top of the interview that I want to sort of dissect into this part of the segment, if I can. Um, I, I I don't want to put words in your mouth, but I would I would gather from the conversation that we've had right now that municipal politics pr isn't probably something you were paying attention to when you were first living in Portage. It wasn't until later on in life. Um, is, would would I be correct in that statement? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so you now are at that council table. And you have to make some pretty tough choices. And I'm assu I would I, I would hope I don't want to assume, but I would hope that you get you try to engage with the day to day people of Portage the Prairie to gather where they are at because you sort of have to figure out if they're struggling, where they can, what service levels they can sort of need or want. Um, are people willing to give you their opinion on issues in front of council or like you prior to leaving for Winnipeg and BC? As long as my garbage is picked up and my water's turned on, that's all I care about. And just do what you need to do to make our city better. Well, there are a lot of people <laughs> who definitely give their opinions. Uh, <laughs> some, <laughs> some through email, some through phone calls. Uh, but for the most part, social media. I see a lot on social media. And uh, I really wish that a lot of those people who who have opinions, uh, positive or negative, uh, would would come to our council. Our, our meetings are wide open to the public. Anybody can be a delegation. And, you know, they're, they're frequent enough. They're twice a month we have them. And I just wish that the people who have the issues would come in and speak to them. And, and maybe we can move forward on uh, fixing some of these issues. But unfortunately, if you go on a social media page and tell everyone else your issues, nothing really gets solved by doing that. Well, you're, you're saying social media is just where things go to die? I would never believe that, <laughs> counselor. Come on. That's that's Chris saying that. That's not the counselor. If you're going to send yeah. some emails, send them to me. Um <laughs> You bring up a good point in that answer that you just gave. You said you have to talk to the people who agree with you and disagree with you. How important is it for you to respectfully, and I say respectfully because we see a lot of people, especially on social media, and I'm not saying Portage is the, uh, the, the standard of this because it happens across Canada, that people are willing to say whatever they want on social media, and sometimes it can be quite ugly. How important is it for you to listen to people who disagree with you on issues so that way they feel like they're being heard by their elected representative like yourself? Well, it's extremely important. You know, I, I 
uh, like I said, I, I encourage people to, um, to talk to me, to, you know, to talk to our council. Uh, we are more than open to listening to anybody on any topic because we, on the surface, a lot of people like I was before don't know what a municipal government does. Right. So when, uh, you know, if someone's on social media saying, well, the city's just taking more taxes off my paycheck, you know, well, we don't do that, right? You know, <laughs> and the jurisdictions and we... <laughs> that people understand is quite staggering that I've been hearing on this show. Uh, it doesn't seem like it's any different that than Portage the Prairie. Is it hard to try to tell people that it's not your responsibility without being sounding like you're just passing the buck to another level of government though. <laughs> I don't find difficulty with it because oh, good, um, <laughs> good for you, Colin. <laughs> a lot of people, um, once you tell them, then they know. Right. And, and uh, it's, I don't consider it passing the buck in a lot of cases. Uh, a, a major one, point of contention is is Saskatchewan Avenue when it comes to snowfall and snow clearing and and you know sometimes people will contact me and and that is my preferred method you know get a hold of me I'll give you the answer rather than going and so on social media to uh, air your grievances you know our Saskatchewan Avenue is a provincial highway so um, when there's complaints about the snow clearing on Saskatchewan Avenue Again, it's not passing the buck, but I just let people know, you know, don't be mad at the city. The, the The province is responsible for that. And in my opinion, the province does a very good job with uh, with keeping that route clear, you know. So, but it's just a matter of people not being aware whose responsibility is what, right? I appreciate that. I am cautious of time here. And I have one last question before we move to the second segment. Now, sure. as we are a show that is heard across Canada and even sometimes around the world, but majority in Canada, there are people heading into municipal elections this year. Your neighboring province of Saskatchewan, mm -hmm. Yukon, uh, Nova Scotia are three that I can just think of off the top. And Northwest Territories, I apologize, uh, are heading to elections this year. For those prospective candidates who are potentially deciding to put their name on the ballot, what advice would you give a potential newbie to municipal politics prior to putting your, their name on that ballot to potentially be their next uh, next city councillor or town councillor or village councillor? I would say if uh, if you're in it for the right reasons and, and you really want to try to impact your community and make a change, then go for it. Uh, you need, you need to be passionate about your city or your, your municipality and you don't need to know everything there is to know because you will never know everything there is to know. Uh, I like to think that I have learned a lot in my 16 months on council, but uh, I am just scratching the surface of everything that there is to know about uh, municipal politics and, and how everything operates. So if it's something you have in your head and you're doing it for the right reasons, it doesn't matter how many more people are on the ballot. Uh, if you, have good intentions. I think a lot of voters see that and uh, I would definitely encourage you to do so. I appreciate that. I want to turn to segment two now and I want to talk about the city of Portage the Prairie as a whole. Now, prior to this conversation, I want to preface this by saying this is a conversation between the councillor and myself. This is not a motion of council. This is not a direction of council. This is not even a policy of council. This is his opinion. For those who have listened to that over and over again, hopefully you skipped through the last 10 <laughs> seconds of that statement. Um, as we are doing a focus on Portage of the Prairie over the next few weeks on this show, um, each time we have a new councillor from Portage of the Prairie, we're going to be talking about a certain issue. So last week we chatted with Councillor Joe Massey, who is the chair of the Finance Committee uh, at Portage of the Prairie. Today, uh, Councillor Doyle is going to be speaking about his committee, which is the Public Safety, as he is the chair. So I want to sort of ask an open-ended question to get this going. We are now in 2024. We're a few months into it already. The outlook on 2024 from a public safety perspective in Portage of the Prairie, do you have optimistic hope that people are going to feel safe or continue to feel safe in your community? 
I actually have, uh, I'm, I'm very optimistic about it. And Portage has had uh, its issues like every other city in uh, in Canada and North America and around the world. Uh, Portage has just engaged with the province of Manitoba for a community safety officer program, which is another layer of policing. Uh, the city of Portage has RCMP as our primary policing. And then we have our bylaw uh, for our bylaw policing. This new layer is going to be somewhere in between. And uh, our hope is that these officers are up and running by April of this year. And this is uh, this is very exciting for me under my portfolio. And it's very exciting uh, for the council and the city as a whole. So um, we're really excited to get this off the ground. So what will these new officers be? You say it's somewhere in between, and that's kind of ambiguous for someone who, like myself, who who's followed this story quite interestingly, because I know it was a big push by your mayor during the last provincial election. I know there was an announcement by AMM uh, at in Portage La Prairie, if I'm not mistaken, at Crescent Lake. If 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 I'm doing my history a little bit better here, um, <laughs> what will these officers be doing in the community? Because for someone who wants their community to feel safe, uh, they might hear another level of uh, police or another level of security and they might go, okay, are we becoming a sort of nanny state? And I'm not trying to say that you will. Yeah, I'm just yeah. to <laughs> Give me some details on this program because I think it's a fascinating program that other municipalities across Canada may want to emulate. So um, thank, thank you for your question. The, the enforcement end of it will definitely be part of it. Uh, but what we are focus on, focusing on as a council is the relationship building and uh, being proactive with it. Uh, so the city of Portage is full of excellent social services uh, for every every type of issue you might have. And uh, because you're a hub, we, right? You're a hub for a a the hub. surrounding communities. Yeah, and so what what we are looking at uh, at this time is to help be that bridge between individuals that are uh, having problems and the social services that can help them with those issues. And that that's a major focus for us. So again, the enforcement is definitely part of it. Uh, the, the relationship building with business owners and stakeholders is a part of it, but being that bridging that gap between social services and those who require them, that's a major part of it. And what, what we would like to see uh, once this program is up and running is to have these officers be on a first name basis with their downtown businesses, you know, stopping in, checking in, uh, helping, helping our citizens, you know, kind of safeguard their properties if they see something, you know, your bikes are left out front of your house overnight you know just simple things like that uh, that maybe sometimes people don't think about uh, it, it's just more on that relationship end of things uh, but again including the enforcement end of things as well i'm assuming this is a joint project a joint venture between you and the province fund it equally or is this a provincial uh, is this because i'm just wondering if this is going to impact the tax dollars potentially because i know you are as of recording this heading into budget here soon we uh we did get uh a money from the previous government that was uh on the provincial level and that's what kick-started this program we we will be sharing the cost of of the program with the province. Uh, the province provides the training for these officers. It's a four week training process, and uh, we are very fortunate because not all municipalities are uh, in a position where their local police or their RCMP is on board the way that our RCMP detachment is on board. So. We are very, very what do you fortunate. Chalk that for up that. to because Sherilyn Knox said the exact, uh, Mayor Knox said the exact same thing. Well, when I had her on the show, that you guys have a great relationship with your RCMP. What do you chalk that up to? Because I'm assuming this is not something that just happened overnight and everyone was kumbaya. But what was the building process? Because I know you've only been on council for t uh, short term, so I know it's probably a little bit hard. But for you as chair of the Public Safety Committee, 
what role do you have in fostering and keeping that good relationship with your RCMP detachment? I think uh, it, I would just chalk it up to the ability to listen to one another. You know, uh, the RCMP is is very, very good at joining meetings uh, that would involve them uh, inviting us to uh, take part in things that they do. We have a, a COPP program, a Citizens on Patrol program in Portage as well, uh, which the RCMP heavily supports, the city heavily supports. Um, and we understand that we're all trying to achieve the same goal, to have a, a safe community where our citizens feel safe and our criminals feel uncomfortable. <laughs> and we, we just, we, we really are on the same page, which is very, very refreshing because like I said, uh, I understand that not all municipalities are like that. And when it comes to the community safety officers, I don't, I don't know matter of factly, but uh, I, I do believe that maybe some local uh, police services or local RCMPs maybe see it as a tug of war, you know, perhaps, uh, but, in, in our city, we're very fortunate that uh, it is full support from all ends. What role does the community have to play in ensuring that this community is kept safe? Because the municipality can go a certain distance, the RCP can go a certain distance, but the community as a whole, individual residents need to play a role in keeping their community safe. What does the municipality sort of communicate to its residents to ensure that we do keep the community safe and a thriving, prosperous community that people want to come to? Yeah, we have uh, we have things like uh, public safety uh, public safety events in in Portage, where people can come and they can uh, volunteer their time, you know, if they want, with the uh, program like COPP. And Mayor Knox is absolutely amazing at her social media blasts, just to always let people know, you know. Uh, how to safeguard their properties, uh, what to watch out for. And we really encourage all the citizens, you know, if you see something that doesn't look right, trust your gut. You know, it, it costs you nothing to make the call and have someone come and check it out, right? You're, you're, you're second guessing my experience in Portage of the Prairie now. So I was there in August for anyone who's keeping track of my social media. I was there through August and I was taking a photo out front of City Hall that day. And I had someone stop me and ask me where I was from because they saw me get out of a car from Alberta. Now I'm like, were they just actually patrolling me to see if I'm like doing something nefarious? But I guess maybe I, I thought they were a friendly community, but maybe they were just being cautious as they should be um, they, they, they possibly could be but um we, we are also a city full of friendly people as well <laughs> you certainly are i will give you credit for that um i i, I so thank you so much for answering some of those questions about the public safety. Uh, I want to look to sort of uh, to the future though because we, you talked about being optimistic what is what is going to be coming down the pipeline for your committee over the next few years? Is there things that you want to specifically tackle as chair of that committee? Or are you sort of, in, because public safety is one of those weird things is the more your community gets safe, the potential less need for your committee you will need, but you will always need it. What do you see as your role ensuring that this conversation is an ongoing conversation when these new officers come in? It's not just going to be we're going to drop them off and then we're going to let them do what they need to do. What, what, what role does your committee play in the future of Portage to the Prairie? I, I would say just keeping those lines of communication open, um, getting the feedback uh, from the people that are affected by these new officers, getting feedback from the public, um, and, you know, they, we, we have a lot of small businesses in Portage and I know they sometimes deal with theft and, and, you know, we just want them to be able to give us the feedback. Is this program helping you? Um, the individual homeowners, you know, is this program affecting you positively, negatively? You know, we want to keep that communication open and get the feedback because this is brand new to us. So, um, just because we are going to go one direction in the beginning doesn't mean we have to stay that course. You know, it's a learning process for us. And, 
and we will adapt it however we need to uh, to make it the most effective. Now, I, I'm going to turn to Portage the Prairie as a whole and sort of ask a follow-up question, but outside of the realm of public safety. Now, you, you, you've you so eloquently said on the show that you, you, you don't, you need to know a few things, but you don't need to know everything when it comes to municipal politics. But there are people out there listening to this or potentially people in Portage the Prairie who are going to listen to this and say, Councillor Doyle hasn't talked about the issue that's important to me. The one issue, that pothole in front of my house, that park that needs upgraded. How do you balance, how do you, as a councillor in the city of Portage La Prairie, balance the needs of the community against the needs of the, of the one? Because you want to make sure people's tax dollars are being spent wisely. You want to make sure that people feel like they're getting a fair sh uh, shake of their, or a share of their property taxes that they pay. When you look at individual issues, what do you look at for potentially the needs of the good of the community against the needs of the one? Because everyone's issue is their most important issue. And you as a counselor have to look at every issue as a community issue. Right. And we we can never let the needs of the one overpower the needs of the community. But we can you also have never... watched Star Trek, Wrath of Cog. <laughs> yes. Thank you. I didn't have to say it. <laughs> <laughs> but at the same time, we can never uh, ignore the needs of the one either. Because like you said, this is their most important issue. They are a citizen of our city, and we also can't ignore them, right? So it, it's finding that balance. And, and that's where it comes down to, you know, if, if you have that pothole in front of your house, um, we have numerous methods uh, by email, phone call. Uh, we have a very good app. Uh, City of Portage La Prairie app where people can report these things and uh, don't think for a second that it comes across the appropriate person's desk and they look at it and say mm, maybe next year <laughs> and toss it out the window right uh, but at the same time you know that that pothole cannot be the city's focus because there are 12,999 other people in this city that also need the attention you know, I've been accused on this show of only talking about negative things when it comes to community and public safety. There's a connotation around negative. So let's turn it into a positive conversation for a little bit here before we turn to my last and my favorite subject is tourism. I want to know, what do you believe the community gets right? And I say community as in administration, municipal politics, or even sort of your relationships with the community. From a political standpoint, from a governance standpoint, what does the uh, city of Portage the Prairie do right and you boast about when you go talk to other municipal leaders from across Manitoba at AMM? Communication. I think I think the the city and more importantly, Mayor Knox has been able to communicate almost everything we are doing um, as a council, as a government, and um, and as administration as to what, what's happening in our city. And I have heard so much feedback in the last year and a bit about the, the amount that she is letting people know, which is something that had never really been in place before and people are actually aware of what's happening in their city. They're aware that the city of Portage has no removal routes or uh, you know the the snow sidewalk clearing, what we do, you know, what what other uh, businesses are responsible for, et cetera. I so have a sneaky can... suspicion you're dealing with a lot of snow issues these days, counselor. Is that true? <laughs> Being in the well, middle of winter? <laughs> We had one major snowfall and it's actually, it's beautiful here today and it's almost all melted. So uh, no snow issues this week. <laughs> um, I want to turn to my last segment because I am cautious of time and I know you are a busy person. So I want to talk about my favorite subject, 
tourism. Now, I have made a pledge that if you come on the show, I come to your community. Now, I've already been to Portage of the Prairie, but I've made a promise that I'm coming back because you guys have been such a wonderful community to me on the show of coming on and talking about Portage of the Prairie as a whole. So after the AMM conference in Brandon later on this year, I'm going to be driving my car all the way to Portage of the Prairie and staying there for a night or two. So what are some of the tourist destinations that I as a tourist and even people listening across Canada should do while they're in Portage of the Prairie? Well, that that's a great question. And I will be 100% honest with you. Before joining municipal politics, uh, this, the word Portage La Prairie and the word tourism never jived in my brain. But when when you actually take a minute to, to look at it and see what we have in our city, it's it's really it's it's really quite an anomaly uh, compared to most places. We have uh, we have the PRRA, which is the Portage Regional Recreation Authority, who operates Stride Place. And if you've ever been in Stride Place, we have two hockey arenas. We have Manitoba's only wave pool, an indoor water park. Uh, we have an outdoor water park. We have uh, Lake Manitoba. Delta Beach, St. Ambrose Beach, which is only 15 minutes from our front doors. And that's that's really hard to find in most communities. You can't hit a wave pool, a water park, and the beach all in the same day, but you can here in Portage. <laughs> we've, okay. We've also, yeah. <laughs> we've also got great museums. Uh, we have the, the National Indigenous residential school museum right here in portage as well and uh lots of camping hunting fishing there is a ton to do what do you do well, after a long day of council meetings because i can imagine there are some that probably go late into the night or probably longer than an hour or a half hour um what do you do after a long day of council where do you go into the community to just decompress let it all go and yes i'm asking you to pick your favorite spot in the city and playing a little bit of sophie's choice with you here to say you gotta do it on the show pick your favorite <laughs> My favorite would be uh, our walking path. When uh, when you've had that long day and you just need to clear your head, uh, Portage has numerous city maintained walking paths, and and our most famous one would be right around Crescent Lake. And you said you've been to Portage La Prairie, and and you know that we have a uh, lake right in the middle of our city, and we have a walking path that uh, goes entirely a around that lake. And it's very well maintained. It is paved, and uh, not only is it is it a nice a nice walk from one end of the city to the other, it has beautiful scenery walking across or walking along the lake the whole time. That is amazing. So I have one last question for you before I let you go here. And we started talking on the show about you and who you are. And we're ending the show talking about Portage of the Prairie. So the million dollar question to end this show is, in your opinion, what makes the city of Portage of the Prairie such a unique place to live, work and raise a family counselor? For me, it's the people. We have, we have people from all walks of life here. And you can find, you can, we, we are a small city, um, but we're also a, a larger city. We're, we're, we're small in the sense that uh, people still hold doors open for people here. <laughs> you know, everyone you walk past gives a nod or says hello, which doesn't happen everywhere. You know, I've been to uh, places like New York City and, you know, larger urban centers like that. And nobody cares <laughs> who you are as they walk past you <laughs> you know and in portage you, like i said you always get people saying hi and uh even though we are on on the larger side we're small enough that everywhere you go you run into someone you know and and that's a comforting feeling for me at least is it's that that feeling of being at home colin 
Thank you so much. Thank you so much Thank for you. sitting down with me for the last 45 minutes almost and chatting about your community, talking about yourself. Um, it seems like you have truly have a passion for municipal politics and we need more people like you who go away from their community, come back and then decide to run to give back to their community. So thank you so much. And thank you so much for taking time and being on the show. Well, thank you, Chris. I, uh, I look forward to meeting you when you come through Portage again. And uh, I'll take you around if you want and we'll hit that walking path. I'll show you those that beautiful scenery I'm talking about. Thank you so much, Councillor Doyle, for joining us today. If today's episode sparked your interest, hit that subscribe button now. Stay in the loop with all our diverse content covering everything from municipal affairs to our in-depth conversations like you saw today on the cross-border interviews and even our eye-opening exploration of local governance in the political trenches, local government at work. Now, we are your go-to platform for comprehensive municipal coverage, committed to keeping you well-informed as well as engaged. Your support is the backbone of our growth and the maintenance of our top-notch content you have come to love. If you can, consider backing the show. Every contribution, big or small, goes a long way in amplifying our message. Find our support page link on the Cross Border Interviews website. Until next time, stay informed, stay engaged, and most importantly, just Keep talking.